The also familiar Sahara Desert looked just like this just 5,000 years ago. Back in 1850, German explorer Henrik Barth was exploring the Sahara Desert in Africa when he came across some amazing art in the caves and rock formations. They were petroglyphs drawn by Neolithic people. The petroglyphs depicted elephants, giraffes, hippos, antelopes, and other animals, which confused Barth. These petroglyphs were carved in the middle of the Sahara Desert, an area completely devoid of people, let alone animals. Yet, the animals in the petroglyphs suggested that this barren place had once been like a savanna, with trees and grass only a few thousand years ago. What's even more incredible is that these petroglyphs were found all over the desert, from the western parts of the Sahara all the way to Saudi Arabia. As more and more geological evidence was discovered during the mid to late 20th century, scientists, initially dismissive of the idea, began to argue that the Sahara was covered in grass, trees, and lakes for nearly 10,000 years, from about 14,000 years ago to 5,000 years ago. Introducing the Green Sahara Hypothesis The biggest piece of evidence, dust. Large amounts of sandy dust from the Sahara Desert would blow across the Atlantic Ocean to Central and South America, where some of it would then settle on the western side of the African continent. Back in 2012, Dr. David McGee analyzed the strata in this region, calculating and graphing the accumulated dust over the following period of time. And that is how we got this data. You can see here that from 20,000 to 15,000 years ago, a huge amount of dust accumulated. During this time, the Sahara was drier and wider than it is now. But this is the time period where things got interesting. By the way, AHP stands for African Human Period, when Africa was wetter than it is today. Notice how the amount of dust rapidly decreased from 12,000 years ago to about 5,000 years ago. This means that less dust was blowing towards the South American continent, which in turn means that during this time, the Sahara Desert was not covered in dust as it is today, but was a wetter region with a climate that allowed grass and trees to grow. At this point, it's hard not to wonder, what on earth turned the Sahara into a green meadow? The most popular hypothesis has to do with the Earth's processional motion. This is a phenomenon in which the Earth's axis of rotation spins in a small circle like a top every 26,000 years or so. Around 14,000 years ago, the direction of the Earth's axis of rotation was the opposite of what it is today. During the Earth's elliptical orbits around the Sun, there is a point where the Sun is at its closest, perihelion, and its farthest, aphelion, positions from the Sun. Around the perihelion, what season is it in the northern hemisphere? You might think that it would be summer, but the direction of the Earth's axis of rotation causes a difference in solar radiation. The northern hemisphere experiences winter, but 14,000 years ago, it was a different story. Back then, the Earth's axis of rotation was facing the Sun, so it was summer in the northern hemisphere. This means that 14,000 years ago, the Northern Hemisphere was bathed in a whopping 7% more solar radiation in the summer than today, because the Earth was closer to the Sun. That 7% difference made the Sahara green. Uh, but that's a little odd, don't you think? If it was hotter, it would seem that the Sahara would desertify faster. So why did the exact opposite happen? The first reason is because of specific heat. If the solar radiation in the summer is very high, the temperature of the Sahara on land will rise quickly, right? On the other hand, the ocean, which has a relatively higher specific heat, would heat up more slowly than the land. The air would be less dense over the warmer land and relatively denser over the cooler ocean. As a result, the wind blows in naturally from the Atlantic, where the air is denser, into Africa, where the air is less dense. This means that moisture from the ocean blows over Africa and brings rain, which is how the Sahara region was able to become a grassland, like savannas in the past. This is called the African monsoon, which is simply a large-scale ocean breeze driven by specific heat. 
Southwestern India is a prime example of a monsoonal climate, with areas that are parched and dry when the winds aren't blowing, which then transform into rainforests when the winds pass. In fact, Africa still experiences monsoons every summer. It's just that 14,000 years ago, when solar radiation was higher than it is today, the summer monsoon was much stronger and could reach all the way to the Sahara. In a 1997 paper published in Science, Dr. Kuzbach of the University of Hamburg simulated a 7% increase in solar energy and found that precipitation in the Sahara could be up to 50% higher than it is today. And most scientists believe that the grasslands that formed in the Sahara at that time would have stretched all the way to the Arabian Peninsula, covering an area of 13,800,000 kilometers squared, an area larger than Canada. The plant life that slowly began to take over this parched land absorbed water through their roots and channeled the water through their leaves, making the Sahara hotter and more humid. And then, amazingly, a whole bunch of rivers and lakes sprang up all over the Sahara. Lake Chad was this big 10,000 years ago. In addition to this, there must have been many other lakes, large and small, in North Africa at the time. It may sound far-fetched, but the evidence is there. In 2008, American paleontologist Paul Sereno found the remains of 8,000-year-old Neolithic humans in the Niger region including the fishing tools they used and the shells from shellfish they ate. This suggests that the area once had a river. In February 2020, paleontologist Dr. Van Neer also found animal remains from a 10,000 to 4,600-year-old paleo-human site in southwestern Libya. Interestingly, 80% of the animal remains were fish, catfish and tilapia, but the evidence of turtles, mollusks and amphibians also surfaced. Dr. Van Neer says these fossils provide strong evidence for the Green Sahara Hypothesis. But what's even more interesting is that around 5,000 years ago, when the dust began to settle on the Sahara again, the proportion of fish in the diet of the region's inhabitants dropped from 80% to 40%. Dr. Van Neer says this coincides with the time when the Sahara began desertifying again. Specifically, diets began to include more catfish, which can live in shallow water. He argues that this is evidence that the Sahara was becoming an increasingly arid and water-scarce environment starting 5,000 years ago. Now, at this point, we can imagine something like this. If, in the past, the Earth's precessional motion turned the Sahara green, could the Sahara Desert turn back into grasslands in the future? Scientists say the reverse is certainly possible. It's just that we likely won't get to see that Earth-moving process. And it may be our descendants who are surprised to learn that the Sahara was a desert 10,000 years ago. And they might also be surprised to hear that the Amazon used to be a rainforest. What I mean by this is that if the Sahara Desert becomes a forest, the Amazon rainforest could disappear. Remember when I said that huge amounts of dust from the Sahara Desert blow across the Atlantic toward the Amazon? This dust is rich in phosphorus, which is essential for plant growth. In other words, the Amazon's jungles were sustained by the Sahara. It may sound far-fetched, but this was actually published in a 2014 paper by Professor Edwards at the University of Exeter in the UK. And NASA has even quantified the amount of dust blowing from the Sahara to the Amazon via satellite. I can't help but marvel once again at the organic systems of our planet, how huge deserts can become grasslands over time, and how desert dust can affect tropical forests thousands of kilometers away. Science is a window to the world, and this has been Science Dream. Thank you for watching.